Hey everyone, you are listening to another episode of Divergent Conversations podcast. I'm your co-host, Patrick Casal. And I'm Dr. Neff. And we are going to talk about autistic burnout today because Megan and I are both in it. (laughs) (laughs) This will make for an interesting conversation. All of these conversations are. And uh, we're look at each other and say, did that feel too fucking dark again? But <laughs> in reality, I think that's the that's the purpose here. So I'm in it for sure. And, you know, Megan, I'm always going to defer to you when we're talking clinically, because I think you're you're by far the expert when it comes to all the research that you do and all the effort that you put in. So what is autistic burnout for all of our listeners who may not really have a good grasp of that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and We should definitely add a link to this in the notes. Um, I think her first name is Dana Essel. I I think, I actually don't know her pronouns, so I shouldn't assume her, but Dana Raymaker. Um, They did a fantastic article that is the first to clinically define and research autistic burnout. Um, It's a qualitative study for people who don't know what that is. I really like qualitative studies because it it stays with people's stories. So they interviewed like 19 autistic people. 10 of them were were women, which is rare for an autistic study. Four were gender queer or gender not in the binary, which is again, fantastic for a study on autism. Um, and then I think there were like six or seven men. So first of all, I just, I love a study that's representing autism from a more diverse lens gender speaking um and they found some seams i realize i'm doing the very autistic like <laughs> i'm going way to input you know like here's the design of the study here's the people versus just like what is autistic burnout okay i'm zooming back out you're fine <laughs> um so okay fantastic study people should read it and there's a lot of kind of versions of it that I, I think it's a more accessible read than some peer-reviewed studies so they interviewed folks and listened for themes that's how you do a qualitative study you listen for themes um and you you pull those out their definition of autistic burnout is it's defined by three features chronic exhaustion this is emotional this is physical this is the, all, all the domains of ex- exhaustion that are possible it is a loss of skills, so particularly executive functioning skills, um, speaking skills. I know for me, that is a big one. My ability to speak coherently or speak at all is really impacted by burnout. Um, and then sensory sensitivities increase during burnout. So those are the three core features. Um They define it as three months or longer. Honestly, I think just when you're defining anything clinically, you have to kind of put a time frame around it. But I'm curious about that three months mark, um, why that's there. And they show how it really is distinct from like, you know, culture talks a lot about occupational burnout, that this really is distinct from that. It's also distinct from depression. Now, it often leads to depression, but it is distinct from depression. I think this is such an important thing for mental health therapists to understand because this is one of the leading pathways to suicidality for autistic people. And um, mental health therapists often don't understand burnout. They think it's depression. They treat it like depression, but it, it needs a different support, different treatment. It's also more common among high maskers. They identified that masking was one of the huge factors contributing which makes so much sense to me. Um, So this, I think this really sets people up to be misunderstood by their therapist. If their therapist's not aware of high masking autism, not aware of suicidality. Um, Okay. I'll stop there because I've I've done a bit of a little info down, but yeah, that's the clinical definition of autistic burnout. I love this because this is Megan and my process where we're obviously processing information very differently and, and then relaying it very differently too. And I think it's important to have your info dumps and your perspectives because people need to know that that component too, right? Like this is the definition. This is clinically speaking what this looks like. And I think so often we're using the term burnout in society in general, right? And you mentioned it was more mm-hmm. related, uh, workforce related, like, hey, yeah, we get it. Work is 
stressful and it's hard and you're overworked and underpaid and all the things that come with it. And then that leads to burnout. But this is different. And I think mm -hmm. main components that you mentioned really set that apart. And I, I mean, we can go layer upon layer here where it's like, what about autistic people in the workplace experiencing both like workplace burnout, mm -hmm. autism burnout, et cetera. But in reality, like it gets missed a lot and not just, yeah. and clinically speaking for sure, where, but also in friend groups and society in general, mm -hmm. like the general advice around burnout is like, take a break and like go on vacation or like uh -huh. take a week off from work and you'll be okay. And that is not what we're talking about here. I mm -hmm. mean, and even in that situation, a week off doesn't do it justice, but like, Right, right. Because then we're returning to the life that's burning us out. Um, and that's that's what's different about, you know, a allistic person or neurotypical person who's experiencing burnout. They often can go through a recovery period and then like bounce back. But for the autistic person, like what I see a lot, what I've experienced a lot until the last two years when I deeply restructured my life, it's like burnout go back to my normal, but then I'd burn out again because it was the normal life that was burning me out. And right. so that kind of bounced back and forth between burnout, semi, like somewhat functional, burnout, functional, burnout, functional. And so there isn't that idea of like bouncing back to some idea of normal. Often it's not the case when we're talking about autistic burnout. I love that you made that distinction because that's an important one here. And for the autistic person who's experiencing autistic burnout, when you said a minimum of three months, right? I know we're talking mm -hmm. clinically speaking, this could be going on for years. This could be going oh, on yeah. for lifetimes. And totally, totally. You and I DM each other on Instagram a lot. like, And I did it before we started recording and I wish we were recording. I'm glad you kind of pointed that out. I asked you like, hey, how are you doing today? And that's such a like conditioned question uh -huh. and, you know, like I'm supposed to introduce that way. And you were like, eh, I, I, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm kind of here, right? Like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I, I do wish we were, we were recording that moment of, I, and then I think I told you, don't you know, that's a terrible question, which Please. is funny. That's, that's actually how I respond to that question now. Um, I mean, with you, I'm obviously really comfortable and I can be like, yo, that's a terrible question. Why are you asking me that neurotypical? Um, but with people who maybe aren't as in autistic culture, I will ask them to clarify, like, what part of my life are you asking about? Be because it's it's such a complex, like, what what bucket of my life are we talking about when you ask me that? One, I love that we are comfortable enough to just name it in um, our interaction. And two, I think that's such a good fucking point. And I was talking to a colleague yesterday about like fluffing up emails. Of mm, like, yeah, I want to get straight to the point, you know, ask you what I need to ask you or give you the information okay. that you need or whatever, and just be done with it. But then I always find myself like inserting a smiley face or a uh -huh. LOL or uh -huh. like punctuation mark to emphasize my point or like <laughs> yep. going back and copying and pasting a like hey, how are you today? I hope all is well. Then jumping into the point that I actually want to make. And even operating from that neurotypical lens and expectation of communication leads to burnout because that oh, yeah. takes energy to constantly uh -huh. think about how you are responding to things yep. and how you are being received. Yep, yep. It takes that extra step. Of, I do the same thing. I'll write an email. And then I go back and I like, I warm it up. It's like, okay, I need to like have some sort of intro and, oh, I shouldn't just say the thing. So yeah, that full extra step. And, and it is, it's, a, it's prefrontal cortex work. Every time we're doing that, we do it in email, we do it in conversation. So all of these things that are happening on a more intuitive level for other people that we do when we mask, you know, that's all that prefrontal cortex, which is part of why it makes so much sense to me that masking is such a significant factor when it comes to burnout. Yeah, just think about how much energy is being spent all the time and mm -hmm. how much is being absorbed all the time. And the differentiation there between like 
once you start to get into that burnout place where you mentioned a lot of it is sensory and mm -hmm. that overstimulation. I'll give an example. I was hosting a retreat that I was running a couple of weeks ago in New Orleans and I was already, you know, I'm recovering from surgery. My energy is low. My capacity is low. My distress tolerance is already low. It was, it hit me in a moment where I was sitting in the room with 20 people. They're all socializing. They're all having fun, but I'm picking up on like every word that everyone is saying. It's starting to get louder. And then every noise is starting to like become more and more irritating and the temperature is getting really hot. Mm. And I'm starting to find myself like stimming and like needing the, the need to just regulate myself. And mm -hmm. I just realized in that moment, like you're burnt out already and you haven't even started what you're embarking upon this year. And mm -hmm. combine surgery recovery with, you know, the autistic burnout piece of just the realization of when you're in that moment, your distress tolerance skills kind of dissipate. Like your executive mm -hmm. function, like you mentioned, just starts to crumble. Yeah. And that was the first time for me. And I'm going to be really vulnerable here and honest for our listeners, like where I realized I am so much closer to feeling like that I am disabled or unable mm -hmm. to function. Mm -hmm. And that the world that sees me does not see it because of how much energy mm -hmm. and effort goes into doing whatever I'm doing. Yeah. And I had this major fucking grief moment in that moment where I was like, not only am I recognizing this, but I also realized like I've created this thing in my business that am I really not capable of actually doing? Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. That was really hard to try to process in that moment. Hmm. It sounds like such a claustrophobic moment when you describe like being in that in that moment, seeing what you had to do in front of you, and then like the the limits you were encountering in your body. Yeah, yeah, it was it was hard, and you were one of the first people I thought about messaging that to because hmm. I, was, I need to talk to someone about this who kind of understands what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just such a challenge in that moment. And all you want to do is like retreat and mm -hmm. turn off the world and disappear from it. And yeah, I know that that is a way to sensory soothe too. But when you're expected to be participating, uh -huh. involved or hosting or coaching or whatever the responsibility is, it becomes too much. I know for me in those moments, um, there's a narrative that kicks in. I should be able to push through. What is wrong with me that I can't push through? Yep. Is that, was that part of it too? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It was yeah. like, that was coming up. You're letting your co-host and business partner down because mm -hmm. you're not pulling your weight. Why mm -hmm. can't you just do the thing that you've done before? Mm -hmm. um, clearly something is wrong with you mm -hmm. and you're not able to do this thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like having fucking limitations placed upon what oh I Oh my do. gosh, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's something I've, I've thought so much about the last two or three years is is the limits and how yeah. that is, for me, it, it, claustrophobia, claustrophobic, that is the word for it. I feel claustrophobic when I encounter the limits of my body. And they feel like they shouldn't be there. Like even when I am... Like my head knows, right? Like the social disability model and autism is a disability. And like, I know these things, but in those moments, like my my felt experience is still, there is something wrong with you that you can't push through. And I'm not attributing it to being disabled. I'm not attributing it to being autistic. It's because it's been so baked into me my whole life that you should be able to do what others can do. You should be able to push through. Why are you making this so hard? it's in your head, like all those narratives are still baked into my body. Yeah. When that's coming up for you, I mean, how are you, how are you managing that? How are you kind of getting through those moments? Because they can be mm -hmm. so painful too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so debilitating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'll answer two ways. Um, on one level, I think I've restructured my life to reduce those moments, right? I, it's interesting. Sometimes when I disclose this to people, people seem surprised and I realize like, oh yeah, if you encounter me digitally, you might not realize this. Like I rarely leave my house. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go on walks, but 
I I rarely see people. I, I rarely interact with people in in body form. Um, I rarely commit to things where I know I might encounter that claustrophobic. Like I I'm very I've got a pretty fierce like autonomy demand avoidance streak going on. So one, I've I've structured my life I think to avoid those moments. I I was. Um, Last year, I was adjuncting at a university, leading a like a clinical team once a week, and I'd it was just it was three hours, eight students, but I'd come home exhausted and be so exhausted the next day, and and I stopped doing that this year. So that'd be an example of of I have restructured my life to avoid those painful moments. Um, and then what do I do when I am encountering those moments? I I'm like I do a lot of. I'm very meta in how I talk to myself. So I'll talk myself through it of like, I'll identify the scripts that are playing and I'll, I'll remind myself of the scripts I know that are true, but that I don't yet, like they're not living in my body yet. So I'll do, I'll do a lot of that kind of mindful naming of scripts and the way I talk to myself and remind myself. Um, and, and then I'll check in of like, what do I need? And I'm typically able to get myself some version of what I need. Yeah, I love I love that answer. And, you know, I think the ability to restructure is wonderful. And I also think that for us, we've talked about this before. It's also a privilege that we have. Absolutely. To be to. Absolutely. And I start yeah. thinking about like, what if you can't, what if you don't have yeah. the ability to yeah. restructure and, and really be mindful of how your days are laid out and who you're interacting with mm-hmm. and when and having control and autonomy. Yeah your situation like that i i'm so glad you brought the privilege piece up because i think this is such an integral part of the autistic burnout piece is i'm very aware i've been able to restructure my life because of my my all of my privileges um when i started my business at that point we were dependent on my spouse's income so there was economic privilege i have a doctorate so it, there's a lot of education like gives me a lot of mobility in the professional space. Um, so I I feel that when I work with clients in burnout who are, you know, whether they're in middle of graduate school or due to socioeconomic barriers or name any of the barriers, cannot restructure their life. I think that's when I as a therapist feel the most stuck of like there are systemic issues here. There are like neurobiological vulnerabilities here. There's very little I can say, like, yes, we can talk about their sensory profile and we can talk about how to recover. But at the end of the day, there's these very real systemic blocks that we're running into that I have no control of. And that that feels so not claustrophobic. That's like my word of the day, apparently. That also feels I feel very stuck when I'm in that place with clients. Yeah. Yeah. I. That's such a that's a great point, because. There's nothing as the therapist that you can do to change that situation mm-hmm. or their 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 experiences mm-hmm. and or responsibilities even and that's it's so challenging because the system is not designed for folks who can't fit into that neurotypical model, especially in the mm-hmm. workforce. It's just ninety nine percent of it just doesn't feel well suited or set up with our needs in mind Mm -hmm. and then also thinking about kind of supports for for disabled people of like when someone when they're they're functioning there's issues with that word but it it, okay when they're functioning yeah when their function ebbs and flows like we don't really have societal support for people like that. I think individually, we don't know what to do with ourselves when we're someone who's, you know, I can go from like speaking on a stage to be non-speaking and lying flat on the couch the next day. Like there's not really a template for, for folks of us who have such a range um, because, because there's so many spikes and there's so many valleys and, um, yeah, there, there's not great, great supports built in. We have to kind of figure them out ourselves, which again, if you have privilege, you're able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the paradox here, right? It's like, 
But even with that being said, to share from our own experiences of recognizing our privilege, but also recognizing that we are currently stuck or feeling like we're in our own versions of our own autistic burnout of we still have responsibilities to take care of, right? Like I know you have your kiddos. I have two businesses to run. Mm -hmm. Those responsibilities don't go away. And that means that I have to get really laser focused and really intentional about what I'm saying yes to and what I'm not mm -hmm. responding. And yeah. for the people pleasers in us, like myself, who I, mm -hmm. I feel like covering people pleaser, I feel like shutting off the world. There's this almost push pull guilt feeling of like not responding to people. And it feels good to have people in your life where you can just tell them very, very honestly, like, I can't, I can't do this mm -hmm. right now. This is all I'm capable of doing. And yeah. for me, that typically looks like turning all of the lights off and laying in bed, mm -hmm. watching something that's mindless over and over and over again and not mm -hmm. able to do anything else. Yeah. And but that also comes, there's a cost there too with like partnerships mm -hmm. and communication and and just connection and but that's that's really all I can do and coming back from New Orleans I laid in bed mm -hmm. for almost a week and a half like if I wasn't mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. one or two things a day that I had built in that was all I could do hmm. so I'm having a new thought listening to you talk and like the picture of you in a room lights off week and a half and and knowing you knowing that like yes Game of Thrones like is um, enlivening for you, but also knowing that you 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 do thrive on relationship and connection. Um, okay, so here's here's the thought I'm having. What if the recovery from autistic burnout is depressing, like in the sense of like isolation, darkness, um, like what a brutal catch twenty two. If if what we need for our bodies to recover are also things that disconnect us and like slow our bodies down to a degree that that we're then losing connection with the things that give our life meaning and joy and um yeah I don't know do you yeah how like how are you can I ask how are you faring after a week and a half of like dark room recovery yeah um one I think that's a wonderful point that you just pointed out like you're a spot on those the things that we need may also be the things that do lead to that depressive state so it is that catch-22 and you and i are both adhd um the adhd parts of me are like this is fucking terrible like laying yeah, here cool. doing nothing mm -hmm. not creating mm -hmm. not feeling energized like not feeling mm -hmm. like there's a spark or something to get excited about and the autistic part wins every time because it's like waving the white flag, right? Of like, I, I can't, like, I can't do yeah. more than I can do right now. Um, but to answer your question, how am I doing now? <laughs> um, I still feel it. And I, I can't, I can't connect the dots between what is still recovery from surgery and what is, yeah. what is also this autistic burnout piece. I think that they're both kind of intensifying the other. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, absolutely. I just feel like if I'm typically running on like at 100% right now, I feel like I'm at like 20%. So it's pretty depleted. Yeah. And then the question becomes like, how do you replenish that to even get to a place where you can at least get through the day and and the tasks that you've created for yourself? I think that's a catch-22 of being an autistic entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because in, in New Orleans, I was thinking, okay, you're going to Costa Rica to speak at a conference, which I actually backed out of today, and I feel very proud mm -hmm. of myself for doing. Yeah. Um, and then you're hosting a retreat in Ireland, and I just kept thinking, if I can't do this stuff, like this is my, this is my world right now. And that's why I think the next month, going into February, you know, I don't know when we're going to publish this episode, um, just for frame of reference, like I'm going to be doing very little until I leave to go to Ireland in March because I want to conserve and like 
regenerate and replenish as much energy as I can. But here's the catch 22 to that, Megan. Ireland will then take all of it and more. So you're playing this catch up yeah. all the fucking time of like, how do I replenish? How do I recharge if I'm constantly depleting? I wonder if a, not not necessarily better, but an alternative term for demand avoidance would be like energy scarcity mindset of like demand avoidance is so logical based on what you're just describing of you have to store up energy for six weeks to go do a 10 day thing and then you have to recover from it. Yeah. Energy scarcity mode. Can we make that a thing? Yeah, I think we could definitely make that a thing. I think we can do an episode on that. I mean, I think you're so right because the demand avoidance, like you said, is very logical. When you lay it all mm-hmm. out, it's like, yeah, of course I'm going to avoid mm-hmm. this. But in reality, it's like, I'm just so aware of how much energy it is going to take mm-hmm. and yeah. how much I'm going to be depleted that you have to go into that scarcity mode of like, I, I can't give it anywhere else because there's nowhere else to give it or to receive it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of um, like when I get an alert on my, you know, iPhone or like Apple watch of like, you have low battery. Would you like to go into low pad, low power mode where it's like, okay, we're going to, all of the things that are draining power, we're going to turn it off. Um, It's kind of like living in low power mode. And then when that becomes your life, I think it's hard to not be depressed. Yep. Because that's that's really when you're in that mode where, okay, you turn it all off, right? And you you recognize that you're there or you're you're very aware of what's going on. But then you can't say yes to the things that do bring you satisfaction mm-hmm. and joy because you're depressed and you feel mm-hmm. run down and you feel antisocial. Like I feel like I don't want to interact with people. And that's a good indicator for someone like myself mm-hmm. to acknowledge like this is where I'm at because I thrive on the connection that I have. Mm-hmm. And for me to want to avoid that at all costs is usually a very good indication of like, okay, we've arrived here and this is where we're at. I love that you have a litmus test of like, this is my gauge of I know kind of where my power mode's at. Um, for you, it's kind of how you respond to connections. Um, for me, it's how I respond to ideas or books. Um, when I, and this was before I realized I was autistic, I, I've always I've always been an avid reader. I love philosophy. I love kind of existential, deep books and reading and playing with ideas. When I can't pick up a book, it's like, oh my goodness, what is wrong with me? Um, because and partly because I've had so much chronic fatigue, I could I could pretty much always sit on the couch and read a book. But those moments in my life where I couldn't pick up a book, I couldn't listen to a podcast that had ideas. I couldn't take in any new ideas. That was my litmus litmus test. Pronunciation is a hard thing for me. You'll realize that by doing a podcast with me. I'm speak and make up words all the time. Um, but yeah, so I I think it's really helpful for people when they know what their litmus test, however you say that word, is. Um, of oh, this is a sign. I, I'm entering low power mode. I'm entering burnout. I love that you just named that. Are you in that mode right now, where books, new ideas, are just not? Um, so that's what I actually can't tell. I was thinking about that as we started like, okay, am I an autistic burnout or is this like winter chronic fatigue? And I, I think that's, I've had chronic fatigue essentially since I had kids. So it's hard for me to tease out what is burnout, what is chronic fatigue. I, you know, I make a workbook a month, which <laughs> is a lot of work, but I've been able, right now I'm working on one about just how we relate to our thoughts and cognitions. And I've been able to really enjoy learning about some of these concepts and reworking them. So the fact that I'm able to enjoy parts of it, to me, I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not at completely like burnout mode. I'm, but other areas of my life are definitely, I can tell I'm in burnout mode. Um, so I would say I'm like, yeah, I, I 50%. If you're at 20%, I would say I'm at 50% because I still have things that can spark my curiosity. When I'm in deep burnout, nothing sparks my curiosity. And I think that's the exact point right there. That's it. You just nailed it. Something can spark your curiosity. Mm-hmm. But if mm-hmm. it can't, yes. that is a great indication mm-hmm. that you are 
that is where you are, that you are in yeah. autism burnout. And I want all of you listening to think about what is what are the things that spark your curiosity? What are the things that you feel really like energized by and passionate about, interested in? If nothing is coming to mind right now, if you're feeling any of the things that Megan and I are talking about, could be a very good indication that that's where you're at as well. And I think one thing that we're not touching on that's important to name too is I think when you are in autistic burnout, substance use is going to ramp up drastically. Absolutely. Absolutely. I noticed that for me. Yep. That was at a fucking retreat in New Orleans, which mm -hmm. is a city of debauchery and mm -hmm. surrounded by 20 people that I had to be on for the entire time. So substance alcohol is my best friend mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. Because yeah. It, I was messaging about that of like the, the socializing piece, the dropping mm -hmm. into feeling quote unquote socially. Mm -hmm. happy, right. Yeah. Of being able to interact with people. Mm -hmm. Wow. To be able to have some semblance of small talk, alcohol yeah. has to be the lubricant for me. Mm -hmm. And acknowledging that is the realization of like, you have to pay attention to that for yourselves, for any of you who are listening, like mm -hmm. whatever the substance of choice or process of choice is, because it can get dangerous very quickly and it can get out of yeah. hand very, very quickly too. Yeah. 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 So I, this is interesting. This isn't something I've talked much about. I, I, I hope to talk more about it because I think it's a really important part of, um, of being neurodivergent, of burnout, but I, I have struggled with disordered relationship to alcohol in the past and particularly around burnout. Um, and I think it's, so it's interesting. I'm, I'm curious about this, something I've noticed. So, so my spouse and I respond really different to alcohol. For me, it energizes me. For them, he's like ready to go to sleep after a glass or two of wine or beer, whatever it is. Um, I notice among autistic people, and this is totally anecdotal, I notice that, that it tends to be more energizing for them, which I'm really curious about. So for me, I often used it to energize and as like liquid dopamine. So if I had papers to grade or some tedious task and I was in burnout, then I'd be like, oh, well, I'll pair it with some wine tonight. Um, and that became like I, I because I could not mobilize and, and it was before I knew about ADHD and autism. So I had no like medication support around dopamine and stimulants. So I think whether it's socializing because it takes the sensory edge off and it makes socializing easier or whether it's to try and motivate us or because it gives us this kind of faux sense of regulation and, and energy. I think there's so many reasons we're really vulnerable to, particularly, I would say, alcohol um, during yeah. burnout. I agree 100%. And with everything you just said, including the energizing component, and you're, there's such a cost to it, too, because mm -hmm. so many people don't sleep well. And then you throw right. in alcohol into the mix. And it, I mean, it's just so challenging. So really trying to, you know, figure out, for our, co for our listeners to, you do a great job, Megan. I want to highlight this of like really posting valuable, tangible content where you can put it into motion immediately and start putting it into place. And you talk about sensory soothing a lot and you talk about mm -hmm. skills and techniques to, to kind of manage burnout when you're in it. And I'm just curious about things that our listeners who may not be mental health professionals and mm -hmm. have access to things that we do um, that they can do when they're experiencing some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, I've got cascading thoughts happening. Um, so on, on one, I mean, I think identifying those self soothers that are like faux, faux self soothers, like they're not, they're self soothing in the moment, but they're actually making your burnout worse. So things like alcohol use or other substance use, um, I would think identifying those and really targeting those things because those create a, a cycle, a loop that then perpetuate the burnout. Um, and I, I think for a lot of people working with a medical provider or a mental health therapist, when they're targeting those self-soothers that are actually in the long run causing more harm, it can be really helpful to work with someone around those things. Um, and then I, yeah, I talk about sensory detox a lot, sensory soothing, 
you have to have some interoceptive awareness to be able to identify when you're sensory overloaded and then soothe yourself. So sometimes you have to actually go back a few steps and um, kind of work on interoceptive awareness, um, which there's some kind of simple mindfulness. That sounds like a big thing, work on interoceptive um, awareness. But there's simple mindfulness things like I have a smoothie right here. I can grab my smoothie. I can focus on the sensation of the coldness on my hand and what that feels like. I can do that for 10 seconds while I drink my morning smoothie. Um, and by mindfully attending to the sensory experience, putting my smoothie down, noticing the difference in my hand, that's interoceptive awareness builder right there. And it's it's not an extra I have to do in my day. It's when I'm grabbing my coffee or my smoothie. Um, wow, I'm like diverging all over the place. So interoceptive awareness, um, sensory soothers, like using all the kinds of sensory accommodations that can be helpful and for it often I think takes a lot of experimenting especially for later in life diagnosed people and high maskers who maybe are so disassociated from their body by the time they get to diagnosis or identification um, it takes a lot of experimenting to figure out what is soothing for my body what is my body like what doesn't it like so giving yourself a lot of kind of play space to figure that out um, rest, just lots and lots of rest, dropping demands. Um, and those can be small. Like sometimes we think, well, I can't leave my job or I can't, you know, walk away from my business. For our family, um, there's some demands that can always be dropped. For example, family dinner. If someone is having an overloading day, they don't, they can eat in their room. They can eat in a quiet space that's a that's an example of a more simple demand drop and so, or maybe not showering that day like there can be these more simple demand drops but i think thinking through where can i drop demands um and spending less time masking so figuring out who are the safe people to be around who i don't have to mask as much um are there things i can say no to the say no is huge just like working on boundaries and then that gets into people pleasing. And again, working with the therapist, I think around why is say no hard can be really helpful. I just spewed off a random list. There, there's more, but, and I think, I think I have, I have a few blog posts that talk about recovery tips. We can link to that. It's, you're going to get a more linear version of me when I write versus when I talk. I like to get both versions because both are unbelievably helpful. And I just learned a new word today from you. So I interoceptive. I did not know that term. So, you know, yeah. here we are. But these are great tips. And I think you're so spot on when it's like different things are going to work for different people. And it's so easy to say, like, here's a here's a list of 10 things to try. Try things out. You know, for me, I always need to take hot showers. And like, I've always yes. been upset with them. Me and too. I don't realize why I take two showers a day. But now I have a very good understanding. And just doing those types of things um, have been really helpful. And again, hitting home on having a neurodivergent affirmative therapist, really important if you, mm -hmm. you know, struggling in, in your autistic, if you're ADHD, if you have any form of neurodiversity, like having good therapy is so crucial. And yeah, being able to unmask, like Megan said, so when you go on a podcast with your friend, and you know each other, you don't start with the conversation with, hey, what are you doing today? Knowing that Megan is going to say, oh, that's a really bad question. Um, but those, those are the things, right, that we were talking about, the little things that build up. So if you can remove these little things from your day-to-day, -day, like the energy it takes to revisit your emails, the energy it takes to communicate mm -hmm. with friends, I think, or your, your loved ones, it's really helpful because... It's just that one extra fucking thing that you don't have to do or you don't have to worry about or you don't have to put your energy into. And I think it's so hard when everything takes that extra little bit of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been a really great conversation about a topic that I think is obviously near and dear to our hearts and that we know a lot of you are experiencing in the moment or have experienced. and. I hope that this has been helpful and we're going to continue to have conversations about these topics that a lot of people are just not having. And I think that 
getting this perspective is is really great. So, um, yeah, I don't have anything else to add today. I think I'm hitting my limit. So I'm going to be honest about that on air. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's where I'm at. I love that. And that's perhaps the best you asked about, like, what can people do to help with burnout? I think that's actually probably one of the best things is to recognize when we're at our limit and honor it. Yeah, I, I've i gotten used to now post-surgery two things a day and my schedule is my mm-hmm. limit. And that used to be really hard and it's getting to be a welcomed part of my week where I can mm-hmm. say like, all right, I get to talk with Megan for my second thing of the day and then I'm done. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think for any of you listening, all this information will be in the show notes too. All the links to the th- to the blogs Megan's talking about and the articles. And um, I just hope that this has been helpful for everyone too. Mm-hmm. We still don't know how to close this podcast out. So didn't we come up with like an awkward. Yeah. We're just going to say goodbye and then turn it off. Yeah. But we had some kind of tagline. I'm trying to remember at the moment of like the place where we do awkward goodbyes. Goodbye. <laughs> The place where we do awkward goodbyes on the Divergent Conversations podcast coming out every single week. Goodbye. Perfect. Perfect.